Hi, everyone. It's Raghu, and I'm back with another Mind Rolling. Uh, this is a little bit of an intro to this podcast that's coming up in this moment, and it's with Sabrina and Jai, and uh, she's this absolutely wonderful being of light who, uh, boy, does she embody what Ramdas always talked about, the combination of living with one's humanity and divinity, two different planes of consciousness at the same time. And she's done a lot of great work with James Gordon, who has a center for mind-body medicine. And I, I just wanted to, uh, to really prompt everyone on this particular podcast because it meant so much to me. Um, you know, sometimes you encounter somebody who's just absolutely such a is essency being and uh, so i i thoroughly enjoyed this podcast and she's a trauma expert so uh very appropriate for what we're all going through these days right uh and uh oh and also i as you'll see in the beginning of the podcast i mispronounced her name because I wasn't smart enough. I thought I was doing the right thing. And I wasn't smart enough to say, Sabrina, how do you pronounce your last name? So it's Njai. And uh, this is something I should have known because I, in my previous incarnation, uh, running a record company and did all sorts of West African music. And that is how th the names are, pr are, are pronounced. Anyhow, my little correction, as well as prompting this just uh, absolutely wonderful podcast, I want to also prompt everyone, there's a new podcaster out on Be Here Now Network, and it's uh, Conda Mason is her name, and she's been involved with social justice, and uh, she's a meditation teacher, she's just Another one of these incredible beings that is so well-rounded, grounded, and yet completely committed to uh, internal self-knowledge. And uh, so uh, just go up to BeHereNowNetwork.com and you will see Conda's new podcast. And the other thing, since I'm here doing a couple of announcements, is to say... Uh, in my other hat as uh, director of the foundation, Love, Serve, Remember, we have this wonderful online course coming up. It's a four-week online course, and it's the Yoga of Service. And uh, please do sign up at ramdas.org to get uh, put your email address in there if you don't already have it, because uh, this course will really... Um, and create, um, I think, a lot of possibilities for people around what we're doing these days with both inner social action and outer social action and how the two really need to uh, run in the same continuum, so to speak. Uh, so uh, it's, it's all Ramdas material that we're curating as we speak, and it will start uh, the beginning of October 2020. So look out for that. And here we go with Sabrina and Jai and a wonderful talk to get some great, great knowledge around dealing with trauma. Hi, everyone. Mind rolling. We are back. And uh, it is a, a new day, and every day is a, a great new day. Uh, we just did this retreat and uh, over the last weekend, and one of uh, the presenters, teachers, was Sharon Salzberg. And one of the biggest points she made was, you always can come back from getting lost, either in lost meditation that you're thinking about stuff or lost in life when you, for instance, take a a gander at the uh, the self-cherishing the buddhists call it which i love that term and i have and 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 our day-to-day -day is filled with some real anxiety these days obviously all of us and i had the happy occurrence to be introduced to sabrina 
Ndiaye, who I did not know, although we have some cross currents. And welcome, welcome, Sabrina. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So, okay, I got to thank John Faneth. Yes. John, who, who works with uh, um, James Gordon and the uh, Center for Mind Body Medicine. And that is part of what Sabrina does. And so this is a wonderful, I mean, I did a podcast. I don't know if you know this. I did a podcast with James. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, not that long ago, maybe six months ago, earlier this year, I believe. Six months feels like 50 years ago now, but I know, it's incredible. (laughs) And oh, what an outstanding human being with so much knowledge and wisdom and heart Mm -hmm. and the whole thing. I think you're you're probably would concur that you're fortunate to uh, to be working with him i am and, and uh so i was so that's it's uh it's fortuitous that in what's going on today that we can have a chat and you can share some of that uh, same wisdom because it is uh, so necessary but before i just want to like get to know you in terms of and this I always ask, and maybe I'm repeating myself too much on mind rolling, but <laughs> I always like to know what are the triggers for you as you were growing up and you came through all of the conditioning and, and circumstances that we all go through to make up that mini me, I call it. That's who we think we are. And what are the triggers that uh, propelled you out of that concept of believing in your thoughts, shall we say? Or your story? Mm. Oh, wow. You really want to get to know me, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Do. So, you know, um, I don't know if they were triggers, but I do believe that everything that happens to us is also a part of our divine purpose. And, um, you know, obviously, um, I'm a black girl. I'm an African American woman. I was I, I started my life in the Bronx, mm. Bronx, New York, and um, my life began in the midst of a series of unfortunate events. But they shaped me. Uh, my parents uh, were struggling financially. No one was really trying to have a baby. <laughs> But there I was, ta-da! <laughs> um, and at this, <laughs> and at the same time, while my mom was was pregnant with me, my uh, my father's father disappeared, and we never found him. And so I don't know if that's a trigger, but I know that uh, my birth was in the midst of of something that I that I continue to teach people is how do you experience grief. And all those emotions, and also, how do you embrace the gratitude? So I was literally born while my father was grieving the loss of his dad. Mm. And we never found his body. They never found his body. But I believe I've had a, a, a very strong spiritual experience in which I got the answers. And I'm at peace around it. But there was, uh, I guess, the part of the question is the things that... Um, that I obsessed over at one time was, was longing to meet him and longing to find him, longing to find the answers, longing to, uh, longing to bring ease to my father's heart around missing his dad. And then also recognizing later as I grew up that I served as a glorious bridge to my father stepping back into life. And he's still he's still physically alive. And um, did I answer your question? Uh, very specifically, I would say, <laughs> just getting for you getting woken up was by um, by love. Yeah, I mean the true meaning of it, which is caring for another and wanting yeah. them to be whole, oh. and turning to that. Yeah. place inside yourself that that's that is the deepest truth so 
Uh, I mean, if I told you my story, it would be, you know, a lot of gloomy bullshit. And <laughs> and then, oh, a psychedelic. Oh, okay, now I get it. Actually, John Coltrane was another part of my Tr uh, the trigger that uh, helped me realize there is something else going on aside from my senses and mine. So wow. yours is far more, uh, I would say, substantial, oh. actually. Well, I think, you know, having um, many different experiences sort of lent itself to me landing at that being the truth for me and also, you know, realizing what I'm supposed to do while I'm here. Mm. Yeah, um, absolutely. It, yeah. So mm. that's sort of how it, my whole career has been shaped on that. Mm. How can I be a bridge? How can I uh, give mercy? How can I um, teach people through my life, through example, um, and through witnessing their sorrow, how to fall back in love again? Mm. Yeah, it's. Uh... Again, I mentioned earlier that we did this retreat over the weekend, uh, yeah. and it, it uh, the theme of it was wise hope, mm. and it came from Roshi Joan Halifax. I'm not sure if you know who Roshi is. Mm -hmm. um, she has a, a wonderful uh, community in Santa Fe, and uh, was very close to Ramdas, mm -hmm. and wise hope meaning open to the possibility or the inevitability rather yeah. of change, yeah. not hoping for something that's going to be the pleasant outcome of whatever we're thinking. So wise hope. So that was really good. And also we talked about resilience and so on, mm -hmm. loving resilience in and, and, and these times. So, but there was one, what I'm thinking about when, when you just mentioned uh, what you did, uh, I'm thinking we played a little Ramdas video in the beginning, and it was mm -hmm. centrally about how uh, he used to say all the time, you can live on more than one plane of consciousness at the same mm -hmm. time. So yeah. I can go through my practice into the one, into the undivided, into the divine presence, however, which way we want to term that. Mm -hmm. But until you, 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 you don't, it, you have to come back into the heart, humanity, and be there and take action. You, you and you can live on both planes at the same time, but it is a tightrope act, pretty much. And you just said this the same thing around uh, grief and gratitude, right? Right, absolutely. But when you were talking about about Ram Das's teachings, it also reminded me of one of the key elements of my teacher, who was a Sufi healer. And mm. in Sufism, we talk about fana and baka. And fana is when you have these rich spiritual experiences when you're going, you know, on a on a on a retreat of your soul. And then baka is when you come back to the world and 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 you have to apply the experience to. Uh, a relationship with another human being or with or with nature. And so we're supposed to have Fana and Baka our entire lives again and again and again. Um, that's, I mean, that's really it. <laughs> you have these, you have this, these experiences and then you have to do Bring something them in. with it. Bring yeah. them in and share yeah. them. Yeah, share them. They're not just for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And well, and of course, Another truism is that we do have to clean ourselves up to be able to do the sharing in a way that uh, really does have an effect and, and can help um, all the way to whatever it is that, uh, that there needs to be more justice about. Obviously, all the stuff that's going on right now is mm -hmm. highlighting that so enormously, uh, more especially for people. White people, mm -hmm. and uh, so I, I, I do think that the both of these planes of consciousness, humanity and the divine, uh, can be. You can operate on both of them at the same time. I do think it takes real uh, practice and mindfulness mm -hmm. practice, and mm -hmm. and so on to uh, of different natures. There's so many. There's something for everybody, really, there especially is. with the. Yeah, the internet and the accessibility. You just flip a button and you're there. 
Yeah, you mm-hmm. can. So, uh, but I do think it does take that. It can't be this. Um, there can be a spiritual bypass by people to not take action. And there can be a bypass for people to take all the action in the world, yet are not looking. Uh, the self inquiry isn't really maybe yeah. quite what it should be. So yeah, and you're right. We do need both. Yeah, yeah. So that that to me is is. Uh, uh, I'm glad we got to it over the weekend. We did discuss it a lot, and then I, I haven't, you know, just really wanted to to talk to you about that and how to land on. Uh, keep those two planes going at the same time because of the kind of work. Talk about the trauma work, though, that you've been doing. Well, my trauma work is sort of twofold or trifold. Um, In addition to the work I do at the Center for Mind-Body Medicine, I'm one of the clinical lead faculty. We do global trauma relief programs. Uh, Well, We're not so global anymore. There was a time when we were traveling around the world. (laughs) Well, you're doing it by Uh, Zoom, I'm sure. Yeah, we Zoom a lot. But yeah, my work with the center has um, taken me to the Middle East, to Central Asia, to East Africa. And the center also has programs in, um, in Haiti and Kosovo and all over this country. So unfortunately, we have, um, responded to mass shootings all across this country over the past several years. In uh, besides Sandy Hook, we have been to Las Vegas, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Florida. Mm. Um, well, the, the mass shootings that happened in um, other parts of, of California and Texas. Uh, we've responded to natural disasters in um, Houston, Texas. Uh, the fires in Sonoma, the fires in, in Shasta. Um, mm, yeah, I mean, wherever, wherever there's something, wherever there's something going on, we're, we're, we're there. And what does and, that mean? I mean, let's take a, take an example of, of one of these, I mean, particularly the school mm. uh, shooting, because the, I mean, that is, it's it's all heartbreaking, but there's a way that's even more heartbreaking. You know, you've got mothers yeah. and children and fathers and so on. So you go that what 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 happens? So Sabine? typically an organization, another organization will invite us in. So if you take Florida, for example, and I must say that I was not the lead person who got that started. And you met you met Jim a few weeks ago, but uh Jim Jim Gordon and my colleague, Linda Richmeister Sear, they really, uh, and Rosemary Lumbar, they really got that rolling. But in a nutshell, the, the school system reached out to our center and said, we know you guys have some experience in guiding communities in teaching their leadership a model for community healing. So when something happens that is that horrific, you can't just have, oh, one person see one therapist and, and get healed by it. It is a mm. community effort that involves working with the community. So we teach a model for group healing. It is not therapy, but it is amazingly therapeutic. And we teach elements of incorporating movement, mindfulness, spirituality, uh, group support, we 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 actually put that concept that you mentioned earlier of wisdom, wise hope. Mm. Did you say wise yeah, hope? Yeah, yeah, wise hope. Wise yeah. hope into action. Because one of the things that we teach is that hope is the medicine. And and how do you connect with your innate wisdom to bring your whole mind, body, and spirit back into homeostasis after it experiences something as horrific? as the mass murder of, of children. Um, and it, you know, it's, it's, it's horrible to imagine. And, uh, the level of healing that we're able to witness is also unimaginable until it happens. So we show up with that hope and, and then people experience it, but we know that healing begins with the hope that it is the portal for healing. And so um, that's a big part of my life, Um, the work that we do with the center. And then on my day-to-day life, I'm in Baltimore, Maryland, 
where I am a therapist in private practice. And I, there again, work with folks who have experienced traumatic life experiences. And uh, it is, I, I, you know, if, if we go back to that first question you asked me, how did I, how did I end up? What was my trigger? My trigger was I witnessed sorrow and I figured out a way around, not around it, but through it for myself. And I teach other people how to walk through it in community. Mm. Some, yeah. That's, that, a, that's what I do in a nutshell. <laughs> yeah. That's a big and word. The third part is I'm a student, like I mentioned before, I'm the student of a Sufi healer and teacher who lived his entire life in a war zone and who left his students five years ago uh, with, a, with a command, bring the peace, bring the love, bring the mercy, um, look at justice as a way of, of guiding people, um, to finding their true nature. Mm. Where, where was he? Can you say who he was? Oh, sure. His name was Sidi Muhammad al-Jamal, and he was actually the, the spiritual teacher at the Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem, that Dome of the Rock, that famous dome. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. He was, he was the, the lead there. And, uh, and then maybe 25 years ago, he got, um, instruction through his meditative practice, through our, through our rituals to come to the U S. And so he went back and forth for 25 years and he passed away in 2015. Here or? He died in the U S but he was buried in Jerusalem within a week. Wow. Wow. So yeah, if that's not a sign that you met a holy person. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. We all, we've all met those people, right? Yes. Yes, we have. Mm-hmm. We are very fortunate. Mm-hmm. Very yeah. fortunate. Uh, yeah. uh, well, sir, you know that uh, Ramdas actually uh, was close to uh, a prominent Sufi, Sufi Sam, who lived out in New Mexico back in the 60s. I do know who Sufi Sam is. Oh, you is. do? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he, he adopted uh, some of the practices for sure. Mm. And... Uh, and that uh, there's there's these old films of Ramdas with uh, a bunch of us hippies <laughs> dancing, doing Sufi dancing on his father's lawn on in in New Hampshire. Actually, it's really beautiful. beautiful. That is beautiful. Um, now you, one of the things you talked about was reaching out to different groups, and I know one of them because you're in. Uh, are you are you in Baltimore or? Not. I'm in Baltimore. You're in Baltimore. I'm in Baltimore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So uh, that was you You all reaching out to the Baltimore police around sensitivity training. I would love to hear about that, given the extraordinary happenings uh, that we've yeah. had since the beginning, you know, the early part of this year that continue almost on a weekly basis now. Well, that was me. <laughs> that was five years ago mm. uh, when we had the uprising here in Baltimore after the the murder of Freddie Gray. And uh, it was interesting at that time. Actually, prior to that experience, I was trying to to start one of our one of our groups with with officers and they sort of brushed me along. Okay, you nice lady, run along, run along. And then <laughs> we had this, we had this experience and I was invited back. And, and uh, while I would love to do it again, it has not happened again yet. I'm saying yet. It was one of the most beautiful experiences of my life. Hmm. So. For, yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. For, it was a healing for me. And it was a healing for the people in that room. Um, We were able to shut that door and I wasn't working for the department. I was just, just me. Another, a nonprofit organization that dealt with um, grieving families in Baltimore city had actually invited me to do this work. And they're, they're the ones that paid me. So there was like, there was freedom there. There was freedom for me to be in this sacred circle with these officers and for them to talk about their own heartache around around 
people dying, around their fears, around their relationships, around uh, their own powerlessness in, in a lot of places. And, and for me, a black girl from the Bronx who has had all different kinds of interactions directly and indirectly to be given the, the holy responsibility of holding their hearts. And um, I'm not saying that I changed every single person in that room because I know they left that room and had other experiences. But I do know that we were in that room together and we had a moment. And what I'm praying for is more of those moments. And I do know that right now in our country, people aren't really, fewer people are seeking those moments, but there are people out there who are. And you mean so, fewer people from, from the police forces or people go, wanting to go in and do what you did? I think both. I think that, that the, 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 that people on that people that work in law enforcement are reticent to to be be in a heart to heart conversation and i think and i'm not saying that it's even it's a, you know there there are a major abuses of power and also people who have experienced the 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 very clear violence and the clear danger of dealing with law enforcement are also reticent to be in that circle mm. and i also know that it is really that is the thing that's going to heal us is being bold enough to sit in the circle and, and to be fearless enough to sit in the circle and to say, who are you? What sort of you asked about the trigger. One of the things that I asked these officers when I sat with them was before you had all this pain, before your back went out on you in this riot, before you had a gun in your hand. Why did you choose this career? Go back to when you were five, six years old. What happened? And they all landed at, I wanted to be a protector. Hmm. So the, and there's this, this word in Sufism that you know applies to every tradition of fitra. What is your nature? Like what, what was, what's the unique ingredient that, that God blessed you with that would lend itself to you serving humanity? And I think many of them were born with that in their, in their nature and systems destroyed it. System, you know, so I think, so people but, might, might disagree with me um, around this, but I do believe that uh, to just look at this one officer, this group of officers does not really address the real issue of how insidious race how insidious racism is and how how racism and oppression has its talons in us and it doesn't want to let go <laughs> mm. it likes it <laughs> yeah. you know it's it's a demonic force i mean i don't yeah. want to get into people's re, you know religious beliefs but i believe in that darkness i've seen it i've looked it in the eyes i know it's real for me mm. and and um i don't believe every single person that chooses that path um, is saying, yeah, I'm just going to step into the darkness and, and kill strangers. Um, but the darkness does take over. It takes mm -hmm. over them. And so what is our role as spiritual beings is to step in there with our light and with our love and our desire to have them return to their nature. And my desire also is to keep men and women that look like me alive. And I, I feel that I can hold both. Mm. Yeah, back to that. We can do mm -hmm. both, yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. Yeah. It's a hard walk, though. You said it was a tightrope? It yeah. is it yeah. is a tightrope. Right, yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. yeah. And, and the causes and conditions around the systemic racism uh, are extraordinary. It's extraordinary. And... Uh, and I'm supposing, you know, some of the police officers who get into these conflicts, there's, there's got to be just this fear, adrenaline thing that's going on. It's not someone's thinking, I'm going to shoot this person seven times in the back. This person, in the doing of it, is, is expressing complete loss. 
Absolutely. Any connectivity. Exactly. To who they are. And that's really actually are. one of the things that I taught them in the group. It's oh, yeah. like, you know, what you, you think about what happens in your brain after you experience trauma after trauma after trauma, after you see humanity at its worst again and again and again, and how you make these associations in your primitive brain. So you take that trauma, then you add uh, heavy doses of Jameson every night. I just threw Jameson out there. I have nothing against any particular <laughs> label, but I'm just saying. So like yeah. you, you try to feed that darkness with, with, with more darkness. Um, and then you, you work in, in a system that doesn't even give you permission to go to the bathroom when you want to. And so you're eating crap, you're drinking crap. You're, you're surrounded by so much of, uh, your sympathetic nervous system being in charge of your life experiences and your decision-making sucks. I mean, that's just a very scientific word. Yeah, but, right. <laughs> your, your decision-making begins to suck. And, and um, it is, there is this, this default to um, create, I mean, our racist, our racist system creates enemies. So. Yeah. How, why do you think the... Paul, the Baltimore uh, police did not get, call you back. You think well, I I don't know. I'm still waiting for a sec for a, a fourth date. <laughs> mm -hmm. Actually, you know, I, I'm not sure. Um, I don't want to make um, make any assumptions. Um, people, I think people get busy, and people tend to go with what's in front of them, and. It's pretty scary to talk about going into a sacred space and opening your heart when you've been taught that to open your heart makes you weak. And when you don't understand that if you have a place to cry, you actually will be a better decision maker. Mm. I guess I'm thinking about the people who would be in charge mm -hmm. and all the way up from there, from the head mm -hmm. of the police department of, of mm -hmm. Baltimore up to the town, uh, to the city council and the mayor and that level that mm -hmm. looking out at all of this is, is just a huge impetus to invite you in, not yeah. to, oh, we're too busy, uh, you can't get at that, oh, we're afraid of what can possibly happen and maybe these officers won't be as... Um, it's disciplined as we want them to be, whatever excuse that could come up. But it seems to me now is the moment. That, and I what you said is, to me, so absolutely true. Of, this is the way yeah. that something can happen to make yeah. the change that's necessary, or else it's, it's really a problematic uh, future. For sure. It is. It is. And it's not just in Baltimore. Um, actually, you know, this this last uh round of of people coming out and really expressing strong, strongly their opposition to police violence, it, it hasn't been it's been kind of calm here in Baltimore right now. Um so I think it's it's not just here, it's it's everywhere. It's everyone has to oh, yeah. change, you know. I was telling my friend, it's sort of like, uh, you know, blaming the one drug dealer on the corner for the cartel. Like, <laughs> you know, like yeah. it's it's so big. It's so, so it's, so what we're trying to do at the center and what I'm trying to do is just this one, this one girl over the time that I'm here is, is looking for any door for any person who really wants healing so in my day-to-day -day life, I do see a number of people in law enforcement as their therapists. And it brings me infinite joy mm, wow. <laughs> to be with them one-on-one. -on -one. Wow. Um, and also, uh, right now, I'm about to supervise or mentor to one woman who's a former police officer and another, you know, another man who teaches... Um, what does he teach? Uh, he doesn't teach law. Well, he teaches criminal justice. I'm mm, sorry. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm mentoring the two of them in becoming facilitators. 
And so what we're trying to do with the center is we're trying to teach a few to touch many, many more. Mm. And great. so that, that is my goal. I feel mm. like this chapter of my life is it's obviously doing the work, but also mentoring others mm. while great. I'm still here. Yeah, no, absolutely. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, how about a? Uh, you have a great story. I do know about going down to the south, and uh, to do a trauma training. And you did meet somebody, and it was uh, an extraordinary experience. Do you get oh. my drift? You met someone yeah. who, yeah. Who did I? Well, well, you know, someone I, I who got... is uh, who admitted to being a racist. Oh. That story. Yeah. There's so many stories. So where was I? I don't remember what city I was in, but what I was doing was actually um, at a training. And uh, there, well, let me just pause for a second and eh, just tell you a little bit about my my background so that the story makes a whole lot, makes even more sense. Okay. Um, I was born in the Bronx, but I've lived all over this world, all, all over the country rather, and uh, sort of lived my life in, um, in, in two cities, in two places all the time. So wherever I lived, I was always back in the South Bronx. <laughs> so I would, you know, I'd be the only black kid at the school and, and then go back to the South Bronx. So I fit in everywhere and nowhere if that makes sense. And that, that has always been my life. And what I wow. was taught as a child, uh, and it makes good doggone sense uh, at the time, is to be polite to white men and to steer clear of them. And so as I got older, I assumed it just meant older white men because I have these friends and you can't be talking about these guys. You must be talking about people, my parents age and older. So I walked into this group And there was a man in the group who was older than me and uh, definitely a white man and definitely looked like, uh, (laughs) he looked like a caricature of an overseer in a slave movie. Like that is literally what he looked like. Like if you were to cast an overseer, you would cast this guy. You know, if, if, if I had such a skill, you know, he had a a very, he was very, um, he had a bulbous nose. He was stocky, nice looking in a way, but also like for me, I was polite and like, oh, and then he opened his mouth and he had this Southern drawl. And I said, oh, dear Lord, I'm staring clear of you. And I smiled and I said, well, we're not going to be friends and that's fine. So group began and this is why I know these sacred circles work. And when we walked into that circle, it wasn't well, let's come into the circle and talk about racism and oppression. It was, let's go into the circle and see what's coming up for you right now. And that's what we teach at the center. What's coming up for you right now? And what was coming up for me in that moment was some sorrow over um, fear of my daughter being discriminated against in her all white private school. And I shared that with the group because that was what was coming up for me in that moment. And then we the other way that we operate is when, when you're speaking, you're the only one speaking. Imagine that. <laughs> Everyone else just watching you and serving as an exquisite witness to your story. So I'm sharing this. I, I must have been just one moment of sharing. And then the, the stone went around and it landed at my friend John. And that is when John told the whole group. I'm going to botch up his accent, but it was part of, but his accent was a part of my healing hmm. because he looked at me and everyone in the group and he said, I am a racist. I, my daddy's daddy's daddy was a racist. And he said, I'm a white male, wealthy, misogynistic, homophobic racist. And I was like, oh shit, what is this man <laughs> On the inner, but on the outer, I'm real cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> Watching him. And, and he said, mm-hmm. I don't know how many people I have harmed. And I don't know who to apologize to first. So the stone came back around. And I said, well, I'm an African-American Muslim woman with a gay brother. So on behalf of all those communities that I represent, 
I would like to accept your apology. That was it. And the man cried. I cried. We all cried. I mean, this group, we were a hot mess of burning tears. Literally, you could feel it just, just burn away in that space. And in Sufism, we call those, we call those healings veils. And once a veil gets lifted, it's gone. It's never coming back. And once you change a picture in your mind, it's gone. So it, never again would I ever look at someone that looked like John through the same lens because that vision was, it, it's, it's gone. Amazing. It was amazing. And then, uh, you know, a few hours later, we were downstairs um, and I introduced him to a friend of mine who's a Yoruba priestess. Like, <laughs> like this dude, was, he was getting it. And so <laughs> I, I, I grabbed him by the hand and I went over to my friend and I said, did you meet my brother, John? And he said, oh, what did you call me? And he just started bawling again. And if we can just live our life, just like not knowing exactly what's going to happen, but just asking for it to happen. Can my heart be open enough that if a total stranger offers to make an amends, that I can hold that space and give it to him? That's what I'm asking for every day in my prayers. That's why I get up early in the morning so I can be ready. (laughs) Wow. I, you know, mm. so I was mm. ready for him and I didn't even know he was showing up that day. Mm. But the, the reality of that experience enters into your molecular structure so that nothing is quite the same again nothing. is powerful. Nothing. And it allows you to return. And uh, yeah. that, that's, uh, that's pretty incredible, Sabrina. It, yeah. Yeah, I didn't know you knew that story. You've been you you're in my stuff, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, That's good. Well, and yeah. also, you know, I I am a, I mean, I love Sufi what mm-hmm. Sufi represents so much. Yeah. And you know, Hafiz and Rumi and I mean, I've done podcasts where I just center I, I did a podcast with somebody I didn't really know and I said Hey, I got some great quotes from, I think it was Rumi. And let's talk about that from your point of view and mine. And it was just the most fun, Sabrina. It was the most Well, fun. that's the funny thing. This guy that I made all these stories about, he, he memorized reams and reams of Rumi. He was just waiting for, for me to sit and share it with. Wow. It's crazy. It was crazy. That's, He's this incredible poet. I mean, he, he I mean, he, we both shattered. I mean, so much got shattered from those moments. Mm. And I never thought I would ever see him again. And I ended up seeing him again. Really? Well. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. But it was enough for me. Right. Mm. But you know what I want now is I want people to believe in that story. I want people to 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 seek out that story for themselves, that experience. Because when I came back and told my friends, they were like, oh, Sabrina, you're crazy. That would only happen to you. And I'm like, no, this is happening. This is hap- this happened to me. Mm-hmm. And, and the ones that believed me, they went out in the world and they came back and told me that same thing happened to me. Of course, it was a different person, a different face, different clothing, different space, but it happened. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I don't know if you know this person. Her name is Valerie Carr. She's a sick woman. Sikhs, they call Sikh? it sick. No, Sikh, I don't know. Yeah. Oh, they call it sick. I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah, I don't know her. Valerie Carr. Yeah. And she just wrote a book, See No Stranger. I mean, and she just mm. said what some of what you've been saying. And, and she's been doing, um, she's been a, a lawyer for racial justice for 20 years and doing films and advocating and, mm-hmm. and, Grew up in the middle of uh, California in farming country. Mm -hmm. And uh, from an early stage, as 99.999 people of color experience uh, from white people, she experienced it. And uh, so in in her book, it just reminds me, because in her book, um, which you would love, by the way, 
Um, yeah, I was and, trying to find a pen so I could write it down. Yeah, See yeah, no but, stranger. Yeah, Valerie Corr. So she happened to be writing her book. She was in Southern California, I believe, and went to a coffee shop and she was, you know, writing. Mm -hmm. And she heard a bunch of people to her side at a table that were um, repeating racist kind of stuff. And she just thought, and older guys, you know, so on, archetypical. Mm -hmm. And she said, I can't just sit here. I'm writing a book about this. I'm and she's small in stature and mm -hmm. so on. I've got to. So she got up and confronted them in a, mm -hmm. in a heartful way. You know, I am not what you're projecting. And, and so most of them left, except for one person. He said, look, I'm not, I'm married to a, um, a Mexican woman and I'm not completely racist, but he went on and said some stuff that was you know, just out of complete ignorance. Mm -hmm. And uh, it didn't end up the way it ended up for you. Not, not the way I read it in the book. Uh, and, and I think mm -hmm. we talked about it on the podcast. Uh, but it was a something that just, there was a crack. Perhaps it was very tiny fissure in, in his being by the way she came from a, a heartful place but said real things. And uh, boy, that's a, a very difficult... I mean, I, I just look at myself and, you know, I have to do a lot more work on, on patience. I think patience is a, is a huge thing and I've got to work on that. Mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, you know, just thinking I can, never mind systemic racism, which is extraordinary. How about just talking to somebody who you believe is not doing the right thing in relation to voting for Trump and, and being able to really listen? And I know you've, um, this is probably a good segue to talk about, because I, I, this has to be the biggest, uh, not the biggest, but a big part of, of your work. Mm -hmm. is being able to listen. What does listening mean? And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, the sharing of, uh, of people's stories and, and so mm -hmm. on. Maybe talk about that for a minute. So you're asking, what does listening mean to me? Yeah. What does it mean to you? And how does it really, and, and the, the effect it has in a group setting and, and how important, I, I believe it is extraordinarily important, even just on one-on-one -on -one with your wife or husband, never mind, in this kind of a setting, but yeah, listening. Yeah. So, um, I, I sort of touched on it earlier. I, um, to me, and it's been my experience that when we have moments of completely being heard and when we, as the listener, can just serve as an exquisite witness. Shep Jeffries writes about that. He's a grief counselor here mm. in Baltimore. And when we sit and serve as an exquisite witness to another human being's joy and sorrow, they experience, and that, that to me is the portal to healing. That is medicine. Medicine is not just a, you know, a pill you a swallow or, or go in and get in radiation or chemo. Medicine is also um, anything that brings us ease and safety, that makes us feel cared for. So for me, what I'm doing as a professional, um, I don't even call myself a therapist anymore. <laughs> what? Um, what do you I call myself a peace builder. Uh. Because therapy in, in, infers that I'm up here and this person's right here. Mm. It also puts limitations on the relationship. I'm a, I'm a peace builder. And so I sit with people and I listen to their stories. And all I do is listen. And they walk away like, huh, huh. So my heart is open to whatever they, they need to share, which then opens up their heart. And if I tie it back to that Sufi premise of fana baka, they come to my office and they experience fana. Like they, I, we travel through the imagination together. And, and then they have to go home and try that out with their husband or themselves or their job or wherever. And then they come back to my office and they have it again. And they have to go back out again. But I'm not doing much. I'm not really working that hard. 
but 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 the hard part is just being there and saying however broken however ridiculous however many mistakes you've made you can come right back here mm. You can come right back here. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mentioned that. That's a big Sharon Salzberg deal. You can absolutely. come back. Well, that's a big principle of Sufism that mm. a lot of, even a lot of Muslims don't know is that, you know, God said, look, I made you to make mistakes. <laughs> and if you didn't make mistakes, I would have made something else. <laughs> <laughs> because you, we only seek, we only seek the divine through our mistakes. You know, what would be the purpose of seeking that if we did everything right? Yeah. Then that's so, the suffering. Yeah. That yeah. exactly. And that is yeah. that is that is the tenet of Buddhism. So yeah. you know, I I my work is to sit with people and 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 hold them in the midst of their sorrow around their mistakes and to clear up the misunderstanding that continues to exist in their soul around the mistake. Yeah. And to bring them back to love. But you want to hear a funny story? Because it just Please. happened today. <laughs> <laughs> so I just made this beautiful COVID-friendly office in my backyard. And I just had my first client. Uh, first non-virtual client in five months. It was Whoa. so great. We had the birds chirping. There was enough space between us. The breeze was blowing. And these two guys that built my space are next door building another one. And uh, we're we're in this place, and she is back in a really traumatic life experience. And this woman has suffered multiple, multiple, I mean, real severe trauma. And uh, we, we're 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 using imagery together, and I'm we're traveling back to this moment in time, mm. and I and I'm guiding her to bring her adult self to go and talk to this young person that did this thing. And when she came out of it, she goes, I got to scream. And I said, okay. <laughs> She's like, I'm going to scare the workmen. No, you're not. Let's see what happens. Mm -hmm. And so she screamed. And the workmen stood up and I stood up and I told him, it's okay, sit back down. He sat back down. And uh, then, you know, we we closed up our session and, and she left and and the workman stood up and he comes up and he goes, What was that? I was like, that's a healing. <laughs> <laughs> that's a healing. Mm. He's like, What do you do for a living? I said, That's all I do. <laughs> uh, great. They call you a doctor? Yep. <laughs> <laughs> she she had a healing. Now mm. she may need another one around another aspect of that experience, but mm. not that one. Mm done with that there'll be something else right hmm. yeah just, just let, yeah going in so deep and allowing that to be it's it's beautiful work uh the the thing around listening by the way somebody uh, why uh, it's always been a something for me because it's something i'm working on mm -hmm. as well more much more deeply as as time goes on uh but i i don't remember who said that said this but it was a she said, the most generous act that you can perform for another human being mm -hmm. is giving them 100% attention. Absolutely. And I mean, that is, that's what happened. I tell this story so much around meeting Ramdas for the first time where he mm. did that. And it mm. engendered this kind of trust that led me to go, go when he went back to India to follow him there to meet the, the guru. In mm -hmm. Karoli Baba, and my whole life, of course, uh, changed completely from that point. But it was that ability to just be completely embracing and total attention, like there was nobody else in the universe. So, yes. uh, yeah, this is uh, this is wonderful work. It's a wonderful. powerful healer. Yeah, uh, we don't have much time left, but I did notice one oh. thing. Uh, yeah, we're almost into an hour here. Oh man! Uh, but then. Here's something, an article you wrote uh -oh. that I, <laughs> you don't even have to read it, although you may want to read. I read it and it was total sense. But when I first looked at the headline or the, it was, uh, what your poop 
can tell you about your relationship. Oh, is that one still floating around? Yeah, I thought, oh, okay, man. now this is great coming from, uh, from a, therapist. a therapist on trauma and so on and so forth and, <laughs> and racial justice. I didn't um, know that one was still out. Okay. So what's your question, brother? I don't have one. I just oh, wanted to say it. <laughs> it's like a <laughs> fart joke or something. No. Uh no, no, it's not. You, it's exactly not. What, it's not at all. I know. And and actually, yeah. why don't you say something? But it's a real thing, and it integrates so much into uh, not just working on interior stuff. There is work to be done on your body as well. Absolutely. And and I know this because of being in India so much. How real that is. Absolutely. So, in a nutshell. Yeah. Um, Besides the fact that I don't like to say I'm a therapist, I also don't like to infer that that what's happening in the mind ha- weighs more than the other three elements of ourselves. So I tell every single client that comes to see me, I'm going to talk about your mind, your body, and your spirit. And all of them have equal weight in your health and well-being. So... I don't remember how we ended up with that article, but I did. I wrote it for a, a relationship website, and and they were like a different. That's a different spin, and I'm like, yeah, but check it out, <laughs> check it out. If you are constipated chronically, that is going to negatively impact your level of intimacy. Your mood is soured. <laughs> you are not in the mood, and if you're not in the mood, then you you're creating separation between you and your beloved. So everything is related. And if, you, if you're if you holding too tightly, you're going to be constipated physically, emotionally, and spiritually, right? Mm-hmm. And if you're not caring for what you're taking in, it could result in, in diarrhea. So either one, those two extremes are not where we want to be. We want to be in a place where we're in home, at homeostasis where everything is moving smoothly through our bodies, emotions are moving smoothly through our hearts, which then impacts our ability to move smoothly spiritually with the people that we love. So there's, there is no separation. It's all related. Yeah, so, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So we tie it back to the cops. I'd said to them, if you're eating, you know, if you're not eating a rainbow and you're not going to the bathroom, your decision-making is going to suck. Mm. all yeah i mean because it's fun stuff the sound of the words and it evokes these images but the reality is something else it is so important it is very important mind body spirit absolutely oh this has been so great hey do you want to do just a little uh a, a short little uh breath meditation for us absolutely oh you want me to lead it yeah oh look at us okay (sighs) so we'll just do you want me to close us out with this yeah close uh you want me to just definitely close out with the meditation but then we'll say goodbye before we go so we'll just start by just taking a deep breath in through our noses and out through our mouth Again, taking another deep breath in and softly breathing out. And just taking that right hand and placing it over the heart. And as the antenna of the palm of our hands warms our heart, May we ask that heart to be a vessel of change, of love, of hope, of healing. May we ask our hearts to be our eyes for humanity May we ask our hearts to be our ears for the soul of the other. May we ask the heart to guide our steps 
And may we ask the heart to guide our lips and our tongues. May we just take three more deep, deep breaths. And two more. And one more. And when we're ready, may we open our eyes. May we be at peace. Beautiful, beautiful, Sabrina. Beautiful. So, so happy to meet you and be with you for this hour, Sabrina, in the IA. And where everybody, uh, you'll be able to go and look at the show notes and see all kinds of links. Uh, we might even find uh, the uh, poop article for relationships. <laughs> Uh, I've written sorry. some other ones that are, that are deeper. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're going to have it all. I'm sorry to, I'm just yes. bugging you. Yeah. Thank you. It's, Thank you. It's, it's, it's as true as any of the other deeper articles. Okay, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, but thanks so much for being here, and, and we'll set you. up all, all these links. And so, everybody, you can go to uh, be here now network dot com slash mind rolling and uh, check out all the other wonderful podcasts uh, we have. We're going to be introducing Conda Mason, who teaches out west uh, with Jack Cornfield. And uh, yeah, we continue to really share heart wisdom. That's what this whole thing is about. And uh, Sabrina fits it to a T. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. It's my and, pleasure. And we'll have to get together another time for sure. Okay? Yes, please. I would love that. <laughs> All right. Thank Take you. care. Okay. Salams. <laughs>